Hey, man. What are you doing? Uh, I got a lightweight backpacking question for gear testing. Hey guys, welcome to Gear Tasting. Today I wanted to start off showing you a walking stick slash stool that a guy named Andy made for me. Uh, it was actually a trade at a barter blanket event at Jack Spiracos. He has events at his, um, his house slash workspace um, a couple of times a year. So he does this thing every evening during those events uh, called the barter blanket. So you sit around and you swap things basically. It's kind of like a glorified swap meet. Um, he's got a whole history behind the barter blanket that goes back to Ron Hood and um, some things like that that he likes to tell there. But at any rate, I traded some stuff to a former Eagle Scout named Andy who made one of these walking sticks. I thought it was kind of a cool device um, and I just wanted to show you it to, uh, on gear tasting. I thought it was kind of cool. So um, while it's kind of a big for a walking stick in my opinion, tall wise, uh, there is a kind of a method behind the madness of, of why it's so tall. Um, first of all, he had this pretty cool paracord wrapping and I'm kind of a geek about paracord wrapping as you might know from the Not of the Week videos. So um, basically what he's got is a couple of Turks heads throughout here and then a uh, wrapping technique that we've done on some paddles before. But I liked what he did and the premise of this is that these wood pieces, it's a, it's a three part staff, so, or walking stick, the end of it is kind of this I don't know actually how he made that. It looks like it was made out of two different bits and he soldered them together or something. But the end is almost a, kind of a pointed end there. But this breaks apart into three sections because of these copper pipe fittings that he's attached to each of the three sections. And what this turns into is a walking stool. So in each of the three fittings, there's a hole in the top and this you know, being an Eagle Scout, I don't know where he, if he came up with this originally himself or this was another design, but I'm not sure about that. The holes that he drilled in the top of those actually interact with this piece, which is what turns it into a stool, as well as this, this ring. So I'm going to put it together. I remember how to do this. So what you do is you put two sections together like this, you slip the ring over these and there are kind of these cross or X cutouts in here and you have to align those right so that you has enough width to fit the, actually, i do this a little differently. Because of these Turks heads, I have to get the right pieces in here. And then I line these up. So, make sure the ends are correct and I can slip this piece through. Now these all kind of spread apart like this and the seat has these cotter pins which attach into each one of these holes here in the top. And it spreads apart for a stool. So as you sit in it, it, it does stabilize. So I thought it was a pretty cool little device. Um, I like the idea of having a walking stick slash stool. Um, you would have to carry this little seat part in the ring with you in a backpack or something. But um, I thought it was a cool premise and wanted to just kind of show it. So I appreciate Andy trading me and letting me check this out. So that is the hiking stick walking stool. The other thing I wanted to do is just kind of a little hack um, that I thought would be interesting for gear tasting. Um, I got in these Fox Fog uh, pepper spray things to take a look at. These are basically like pepper grenades. So what happens when you depress the trigger, which I will not do on gear tasting, hopefully, um, it actually locks the, the tab into there so it continuously sprays so you could use it as an actual OC grenade. Um, so what I wanted to do was have an easy way to deploy these if I needed to in such a case if I was being followed or something or tailed and I wanted to kind of cut away an OC grenade. That's my premise. So um, obviously the cap could come loose in a backpack or something like that so I wanted a way to secure it uh, with some tape but also be able to quickly remove that and access it if I needed to and 
the technique I came up with that I've used before is, and this is nothing new, I think I've, I probably saw this years ago somewhere, I can't say where, but um, it's definitely not my original idea, but I've used it quite a few times when I've done things like this. But the idea is to take a, a gut of a paracord and tie a little overhand knot in it so it creates kind of a pull, a pull ring. So once you have that loop, you get a, a section of paracord here, and I've got some thinner pieces that I've used to, to actually do this with. But the premise is that you wrap this around the indentation where the lid comes together, so just like so, and then you, you basically cover it with uh, duct tape. So this is kind of 100 mile per hour tape. This is a one inch section, that's why it's thinner. Uh, you could use a two inch piece of tape, it just really depends what you're using. But so what I'm gonna do is, I will start where this wraps into the, the channel there. So there's my lid, and I will start taping just like this. I'll just do this really quickly so you can get the idea. So you want to use a cloth based duct tape when you do this or 100 mile per hour tape and I'll show you why you would want to do that because what happens I forgot my scissors. I grab this from one part of this I'm missing if I don't have scissors. Thanks, sir. All right, so once you reach, reach the end where that knot is and your pull tab kind of comes together, um, I'm actually going to make a little slit into that duct tape. So what that does is as you secure this, this isn't as nice as the OCD part of my brain wants it to be right now, but this is a demonstration, so it is what it is. All right, so that little slit in there actually gets sealed up around the, the pull ring. So once you have that, um, what this allows you to do is have the lid taped, and then all you do is grab this and quickly rip that apart, and the tape came off, not the other thing. So uh, it was because I taped that before the knot. That was my mistake. All right, so let me show that again. Anyway, it did work, uh, but you know it's not much different than tape would be. It didn't really actually work the way that I wanted it to. So let me try that again. All right. So now, that's the secret. I forgot about that, is the knot needs to be outside of that tape. So it's a good lesson learned there. All right, so again, you grab that, and now you just rip that off. The paracord comes off, and now the tape's still on there, but now the lid can remove because you've basically ripped off um, a little channel within the lid. So just a little hack that I wanted to show on gear tasting. Uh, hopefully you can use that for other things too, not necessarily just uh, OC pepper grenades, but um, it got me thinking about it and I wanted to share it. All right, and now for some questions over coffee, brought to you by Premium Boss Black Coffee. Okay, so the first question is from John from Facebook who asked, what do you recommend for a waterproof gear bag? So I wanted to just take a look at some different things in different sizes, obviously, of what I kind of have and what I've used before. Um, so first I wanted to start kind of with the disposable side of waterproof gear bags and that um, in my opinion, is the uh, lock sack bags from, they call them a lock sack, they're by lock sack though. Um, but these are, they state on them that they're leak proof, airtight, um, they're certified waterproof down to 200 feet. So technically, I guess you could dive with them. I have dove with them before, but I have never trusted myself when I was scuba diving to ever just have one of these. And have nothing sensitive in just one, I always kind of double bagged it. So. Um, but I have dove with these before and they've worked fine. My only complaint with them is they are disposable. So over time, the seal will eventually give out, they'll rip, they'll tear, they'll get holes because of abrasion and abuse. 
Uh, they're just not meant for repeated use. So um, yes, they will hold up through a couple of uses, but like I said, over time they will wear out. Um, and they make these all the way from small sizes like this, all the way to monster sizes like this that you can put an AR in. So those are kind of their, their general sizes for those. And we carry the small size on ITS just to kind of um, tell you about how we use them. We advocate taking the boo-boo kit that we have, which is our small first aid kit, and actually putting the contents inside one of these so it retains its you know, a relative waterproofness to it. Um, so then from there, uh, you get into more dedicated uh, pouches and bags that uh, will hold up to multiple uses. Um, this is from a company called Seal Line. They make a pretty wide variety of different gear bag sizes. Um, this is the size that uh, I used at Buds whenever, this is what's referred to as a C wallet. So we used to call them a C wallet. You'd put uh, your ID card and some guys would have larger ones and keep their cans of dip and stuff like that in them. Um, but your room key would go in here, your ID, anything sensitive like some cash um, is typically what we'd have in our pockets, but then we'd you know, zip it closed and toss it into the cargo pocket, side cargo pocket of our pants, and um, that would go through it with us through everything. Surf torture, though, of course, swims. Uh, actually, swims, we would be in wetsuits, so it wouldn't go there. Um, but at any rate, that's what, uh, that's what a sea wallet's called. It's roughly the size. Obviously, I said some guys would carry bigger ones. Um, there were a, comp a couple of companies that were manufacturing these at the time. Um, when I was going through Buds, which was back in 2004 or 5. Uh, so um, this design is still around. I remember this one pretty fondly, but um, this is obviously not the one I carried. I think I destroyed the shit out of mine. But um, these are these will hold up to repeated use, but obviously with the, the plastic here, you can develop leaks and things like that, so that's something to be aware of. Um, anything that you know can abrade will eventually... Uh, deteriorate, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, when it comes to larger bags, and when you're talking about pack size stuff, I like the, I, instead of having a whole waterproof bag, I, I like the concept more of having individual waterproof bags within my larger bag. So instead of running a rain fly or, or a rain cover on a backpack, um, I would rather run my stuff that's sensitive that doesn't that can't get wet inside individual bags because it just it's more modular it's more packable things like that so uh, a couple of a couple of these that i've used this is c to summit this is c to summit um, these are available at rei i'm sure you can get them on amazon too but um, these are just made out of different fabrics one's lighter weight material one's a little bit more durable this is made out of an event material and this doesn't say what it's made out of but I've used both of these extensively. Um, these are, this is 20 liters. Actually, this says Cordura right here, so I'm sure this is some coded version of Cordura. All the, the seams inside are sealed too. That's something to point out with these bags. Um, I'm sure if you looked at this bottom seam, yes, this would be taped and sealed too. So um, again, I've used these quite extensively. I've never had any problems with them. This is either a roll top design, so you would roll whatever gear you had in there and then buckle them at the top and they've got what you know a d-ring to secure them as well so i've uh i've been impressed with these i've only got these two and i've used them quite a bit um, and then once you kind of get into abrasion protection obviously these are good but over time these can even develop cuts and tears and if you're brushing past things especially in the lighter weight fabric um, if you're carrying on the outside of your pack or something they may be more prone to damage then you step up to watershed dry bags. So I've had watershed dry bags for a number of years. They, they're pretty much bomb proof. I've never had any issues with them whatsoever. Um, now, most of them have purge valves on them or, or inflation tubes. So basically what that means is that you can use them as float bags. Um, the zip dry seal, which a lot of them have, and I opened that without showing you here, but you basically just make an S or you kink this and then it just opens up like that. So then it, you just seal it back up, just like a Ziploc bag, and it's good to go. And you can actually inflate them, like I said, through this oral inflation tube to, to blow them up or it actually suck air out of them if you're diving with them. Um, so they come in sizes that come as small as this, even smaller. Um, I think the smallest one they make is like a gas mask size, um, all the way up into big behemoth size like this. So I've got 
a wide variety of sizes of these. I'm a huge fan of Watershed. I've kind of done stuff with them for years. You may remember past articles on ITS where we re reviewed Watershed dry bags, but um, if there was a bomb-proof option for waterproof dry bags, Watershed is the way to go. Um, if you want kind of a more disposable option, you got lock sack and then kind of a mid-road uh, lightweight bag, I would go with these Sea to Summit bags. So, little overview of waterproof bags. Okay, next question is also from John. He asks, what kind of repelling gear would you recommend? Um, so I've been repelling for a long time. I've gone through a lot of different gear, a lot of different configurations over the years, and I keep coming back to kind of two staple harnesses depending on the situation I'm in. So one is the Arteryx Leaf Harness, which I don't know if they make anymore. I was looking online and I didn't see it available. Um, that's not to say you can't get it somewhere, but this is basically just a leaf version of the civilian harness. So leaf is law enforcement and military division of Arteryx. Um, they make things in more subdued colors and geared definitely towards uh, law enforcement and military, obviously. But um, this is a very close match to their civilian harnesses. So if you're interested in this kind of harness and you can't find the leaf version, you can check out the civilian side of Arteryx too for climbing harnesses. But it's very easy to get in and out of. It's super lightweight. It, it works well. I've never had any issues with it. Um, and I always keep coming back to it. And this is more of a this is more kind of a, a all-day wear kind of harness. So if you're around a repelling situation, you're instructing, you're, you're doing repeated repels all day long, you want something comfortable to, to be into, this is kind of the way to go. Um, more field expedient, I always come back to this Yates harness, and I apologize, I can't remember the name of this, but it is made by Yates. And so the premise is you put the belt on, like so, and then you have this kind of marsupial pouch, so to speak, and you undo the Velcro, and this pops out, and you've got leg straps here. So these leg straps are on cobra buckles. They fit around your legs and clip in. It's very quick, it's very easy, hence the field expedient nature of this harness. Um, I really like it, it's, it's very well made. I've never had any issues with it, and I think now that the Cobra, the leg straps are Cobra buckles, but now I think even the, uh, the belt is, comes with the option for a Cobra buckle as well. So that's from Yates. And I, again, I apologize for not knowing the uh, name of that Yates harness, but I'll put it in the description of the video. Harness is the most important part safety-wise uh, for repelling. You're obviously going to need a rope as well. Um, this happens to be a, a blue water static rope, and when you're repelling, you always want to use static rope. So static dynamic rope, those are the two kinds of ropes out there for climbing and repelling. Uh, static rope doesn't have any give. So if you can imagine a dynamic rope like a bungee, which it really isn't a bungee, but it does have some flex to it. Um, so when you're climbing routes and doing uh, lead climbing, if you fall, that rope is actually going to give a little bit instead of coming down hard like uh, a static rope would. But when you're in a repelling situation, you always want to use static rope. So hence the blue water assault line static rope that I'm mentioning. Uh, depending on how long the repel is, you probably always want to have gloves on. Um, these are some really old fast rope gloves from Black Hawk. Um, I just kind of use them as repelling gloves uh, just because I don't use gloves all that often depending on how far the repel is. I know that's kind of a safety issue, but it is what it is. Um, and then you always want to have a helmet if you're around rock and stuff like that too. That's a consideration. I don't have one out here, but um, you can really use any kind of a bump helmet. Um, they make specific climbing helmets. Uh, many companies out there do. I don't actually have a climbing helmet. I just go more with like a, you know, like an ops core, an ops core bump helmet. Obviously I don't use this one. A little bit too tactical for repelling for me, but um, at any rate, that's what you want. And then you want hardware is really going to depend on what you're doing. So, meaning if you were repelling, you can do a couple of things. You can either use a ATC, an ATC, which looks like this, stands for air traffic control, and this is more of a belay device. So, if you're familiar with uh, top roping and climbing. Uh, you would use an ATC for actually belaying someone. So the rope would come up to a point at the top, uh, hence top rope, and come back down 
Uh, one end would be hooked into the climber, one end would be to you as the belayer and it would route through the ATC and you'd be belaying them and controlling them that way. Belaying is definitely a technique in its own that you really need to learn. I'm not going to do that right here, but that's what an ATC is for. But just so you know, you can also use an ATC for rappelling if you needed to. Um, I more prefer something fixed like a figure eight. Um, this is my preferred method for rappelling. Uh, this one's a little chewed up, hence it's retired right now. I'm not actually going to use this in any kind of climbing scenario again. It got pretty dinged up at a past muster, so I have officially retired that. But the way that you would connect a figure eight is you would use a carabiner. I prefer locking carabiners, um, so I always route them in the configuration where you're actually screwing down, and I say you screw down so you don't screw up. So if you had this attached to your climbing harness, it would it would look like this. You wouldn't want the gate of the carabiner facing outward to the rock uh, just for safety reasons and you would always want to screw down. So the premise of that or the reason behind it is that if gravity were to turn this in the unlikely event, uh, it would turn it down and not you know, up releasing the gate and hence opening that. So a locking carabiner is important for any kind of application for rappelling or climbing. So. You might need a couple of these depending on how your setup is for rappelling too. So you always need one uh, more than likely to connect the device to your uh, belay loop on your climbing harness. Um, and then you might need another couple for actually configuring the rappel. So that's why I kind of have this tubular webbing here. Uh, depending on the configuration for your line, you may just actually tie it around an object. You may actually set up a rappel line. Um, using dual opposite gated carabiners. Um, there's a lot of options for configuring your rappel line, so that's kind of why I have those here. And then uh, the last thing would be uh, creating a Prusik as an auto block uh, device so that in case you do let go of the rope or you fall, uh, you have some kind of uh, secondary protection. And with a Prusik, you're sliding that with your hand as you're rappelling, so um, in the event you let go, the Prusik definitely has you. So uh, definitely check that out. We've tied a Prusik before on our Night of the Week series for ITS, so take a look at that if you're interested. So that's just, uh, that would be kind of my bare bones equipment that I would bring for rappelling. Um, again, if you got into the climbing side of the house, then you'd need shoes and a few other things. Definitely a, a lot more webbing and things like that. So um, hope you enjoyed that. Hey guys, thanks for watching Gear Tasting. Remember, if you're enjoying Gear Tasting, please consider supporting with our Crew Leader membership and allow us to give you back something in return. Uh, don't forget to use the pound tag Gear Tasting on any of the social media networks to ask your question and we will get it answered. Thanks again.